Well, good morning. That's just a little insight into my brother and I as children. That was great to see you guys this morning. Uh, uh, last week or two weekends ago, Ernie said, why don't we ever have a clip from Despicable Me? So I found one. So anyway, it's great to see you guys this morning. You know, the world uh, and, and just people in general, we live distracted. You ever feel distracted? You kind of feel like even when you're sitting still, you're like a duck. And you're still paddling in your mind, you're still rolling. And um, it was funny because, you know, I'll talk to Kristen about how my mind is always running and doing different things. And she's like, yeah, I know. Because I bring up conversations that have nothing to do with what's going on. And if you've been here on Sundays, I do that in the middle of the sermon. So it works out really well. So I don't know if you've seen one of these. We're going to talk about planning. I don't know if you've seen one of these. This is a multifaceted tool for your car if you haven't seen this, and this is how it works. So if you have an older person or a person who has a hard time pulling up, when you open the door, there's that little square, and you can put it in there square, and it gives you a handle to push up on. So it's nice when you're older. It also has a thing to cut your seatbelt if you're in an accident. Now, I don't want to say I've been in a lot of accidents because that sounds awful, but as of yet, I've never had to cut a seatbelt, thank God. And it's never a good accident if you have to actually cut your seatbelt. Hopefully it's, you know, and you're like, doggone it, right? Hopefully it's that kind of accident. You, you want an accident where after the accident you go, oh man, that's the kind of accident you want. You don't want the accident where you wake up the next day or, or never again or whatever. All right. So third thing, do you know what else this does? Anybody? Yeah, it's to break the glass in your car. I think that's primarily if you end up in a lake. So, I mean, this is a very, very specialized tool. I, has anybody in here ever ended up in a lake or a body of water in their car? All right, so statistically, you're probably not going to use that, thankfully. But it's there. Why? Because you're planning ahead. How many of you have something like that in your car? Yeah, so quite a few people. Why? Because you're planning ahead. You're paying attention to what could happen. You're looking out ahead. And the idea today is we're going to look in the next chapter of Esther, Esther chapter 5. By the way, if you haven't read Esther yet, great book to read. I can't recap every week because now we're past the point where I have time. And so you just, if you want to, if you want to recap, read chapter 1 through 4. So here's the thing. We all want to look at this story and say that we are Esther. We all want to say we're the good guy in this story. We're Mordecai, you know, we're the good guys in this story. But if we're honest, sometimes in life, we're more like Haman. And Haman was the guy who was self-centered. He was the guy who life was about him. He only focused on his own needs. He only focused on his own wants. He only focused on his desires and anybody else was in the way. And so today we're going to look at three things uh, to plan, three traits of people who make godly plans. And I don't like the first two because I have a hard time with the first two, to be real honest. And we're going to talk about being courageous, we're going to talk about being controlled, and we're going to talk about being conscious of evil, which I talked to the kids about, but doing what is good. So number one, courageous obedience. If you're going to make a godly plan, you have to have courageous obedience. And I'll talk about this in a second, but let's, let's pick up the story here. Esther chapter 5, verse 1 through 3 goes like this. On the third day... Esther put on, I love this, I love this, this imagery, she put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. Now, if you don't remember, last chapter, Mordecai basically said, you need to go and beg the king to not kill all the Jews or to allow all the Jews to be killed. And so she said, yeah, but if I go, it's automatic that you're killed. That's like the default Default, if the king doesn't notice you, if he's out to lunch, if he's gone to the restroom and you walk into there, you're dead. That's how it works. And so Esther shows up in his court and walks in. And, and of course, she's dressed as the queen, which is a good start. But you remember what happened to the last king, queen, right? He said, yep, you won't show up, you're out, right? So when he saw, oh, excuse me, the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he killed her, and that's the end of this story. No, that's not what happened. And we know the end of the story. You know, by the way, happy ending. I love books with happy. This is a great 
And, and there's some really cool uh, plot twists here in the middle of this story. Listen, this is one of the things that because of what happens next is celebrated throughout Israel. And I talked to somebody who was a missionary in Israel. You know what they told me last night? It's the one time of year that the Jews are okay with being drunk. So it's really, you, heard, you knew that too. Okay, so I never knew that. Now I know. Don't go, or, or that's a good time to bargain with people. All right, here we go. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and he held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, this is Xerxes, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? And listen to what he says. Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. Now remember that when we go to the next point. So here's what I would say. How did Esther have the courage she needed to do what needed to be done? And how was she able to do it with the right attitude and not just run in and go, oh, and all freaked out and just start yelling stuff at the king? How was she able to do that? Because if you remember what she did last chapter was she called on everyone to pray and she herself spent time praying. Listen, if you don't hear anything else today, if Marty, if you need to take a nap because you've had so much going on, this is the time to listen and then you can nap, James, okay? So here we go. If you are feeling pressure and stress and freaked out, we tend to make terrible decisions. It's one of the reasons I would encourage you spend daily time in the Bible. Because the news is going to constantly try to get you focused on the wrong thing. The news will constantly try to pull you. Get into this argument that you didn't care about. By the way, somebody said, the French are weird. I'm like, have you not been to Lanuba? What, what? They're, they're, yes, they're weird. Compared to us, we're Americans. You know what they think about us? Yeah, you're weird too. So it's all good. We're all weird. So, so here's the deal. They will try to focus you on something that doesn't matter. And I'm telling you, when you get home today, the news is going to convince you that there's too much wind and water and you should stay inside and hide. And I would encourage you, it's a great time to go to the mall. It's a great time to go to a park. It's a great time to go to Orlando because everybody else is staying in so you can have fun. And guess what? It's not going to be any worse. Now, I hate to say this out loud because as soon as I say it, the storm will turn and come and take my house out. But truth be known, most of the time when they freak out, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've canceled activities and then it's sunny. And I write on Facebook, you can thank me for canceling an activity. That's why it went the other way. This is a joke. So the truth is what? We tend to get freaked out when things go wrong. What did Esther do? She spent time in prayer. I, I want to encourage you. You really need to have a daily devotion time, a daily time that you set aside to spend some time in the Bible. Why spend time in the Bible? Because you've been spending time in social media or the news or the radio or some talk show or whatever you've been listening to, and you've been letting your mind get all freaked out. Why? Because they motivate you through fear and anger. And if you live your life in fear and anger, you are not fun to be around. Don't we all know somebody who watches a little too much news? Anybody know anybody, right? Somebody, some of you are like, yeah, married them. Anyway, right? right? So, so what's the deal? Spend time every day in God's word. Let the Bible not only influence you, but let God pour into your life. Spend time in prayer. Why? Because we tend to focus on the wrong things. So Esther, what did she do? Three days of prayer and fasting. Three days getting away. And by the way, some of you need a news fast. Somebody wrote me last week and said, Eric, I've decided to do a fast from social media. Listen, we all need that sometimes. Why? To refocus on what really matters. I love what it says here in Scripture. Paul says this, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out, listen, for my deliverance. What does he say? All this bad stuff that happens, God's going to use it. And then he continues, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, listen to what his, point, his purpose is. Christ will be exalted in my body. 
whether by life or death. And then I love this. This is almost the same thing Esther says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Earlier she said, and if I perish, I perish. For us to live is Christ. Jesus, I want you to be exalted in my life. I, I, I'm not about me. I'm not about the other things going on. It's not just about my job. It's not just about money. It's not just about success. It's not about whatever I'm afraid of today. Are you afraid of something? Are you mad about something? It's not about that. And so we say, God, for me to live is to exalt you. I, I want you to be first. And the world says, no, 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 make yourself first. Make your own desires. Make your own opinions. Make your opinions more important than people. By the way, that's when we make a lot of mistakes, is when we think our opinions are more important than the people who we should love and care about. If you don't have friends that you can disagree with, then you don't have friends. <laughs> because here's one thing I've learned. With everyone I know, there's some point that we don't agree. And guess what? You could still love Jesus and not agree about certain things. And so do your best to say, God, I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to spend time in your word. Why? Because I want you to be first. Not all my needs, not all my fears, not all my frustration. By the way, she had a lot to be afraid of. I don't know that any of you have been threatened with death today. I, I, I was offered a bulletproof vest for one wedding I did. Can I tell you that's a little distracting? I didn't wear it because I said, is the bride wearing one? They said, no. I said, well, then I'm not wearing one, which I don't know if that was smart or dumb. I'm, you tell me. But I'm faster than the bride. So anyway, I'm sorry. So, right? So I have had that happen one time. Can I tell you it was hard to concentrate at that wedding? I can't imagine how Esther went in there calmly. But she did. But she did. Number two, controlled and patient planning. Control and patient planning. Now, some of you grew up as children and you were not allowed to say no. Whatever you were told to do, my dad had a statement he would say to us. When I tell you to jump, you ask how high on the way up. And that's what my dad believed. If he said move, you moved. If he said stay still, stand still. Now, that's great for a home and terrible for person. Because if you live that way your whole life where there's no good no, you say hi to that stranger. But you just told me not to. Oh, don't talk back. Right? And you're not allowed to have a voice. What happens? You tend to think you have to say yes to everybody. And this is how it affected me. I'm going to give you a very clear and concise story. When I was in college finishing and doing my student teaching... I was going for an interview one day, and so I was dressed up a little different, and one of the other student teachers came to me and said, where are you going for an interview? To which I should have said, nacho. Nacho business. But instead, I told her she went and interviewed at that same job that day and got the job. Now, God figured in my stupidity when he made me and set the path for my life. And that was one of the things that God was like, well, I was going to work that out anyway. But the truth is, I could have said no. And it's a lesson that I learned from telling somebody an answer when they didn't need to know. Listen, Esther could have come running in and said, you won't believe what Haman's doing, right? And here's what she does. If it pleases the king. By the way, he just offered her half his kingdom. I mean, my request might have become very selfish very quickly. But listen to her. Let the king together with Haman come to a banquet I've prepared for him. Bring Haman at once. Remember, Xerxes is a little compulsive. The king said, so that we may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, and this is the whole reason the Jews that do this still. In this, by the way, it's every, every spring they have the festival, the Purim, which I'm pronouncing wrong, about this very event. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It'll be given to you, and what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom. Now, wouldn't you blurt at that point? Somebody's trying to kill me. That's not what she does, though. She says, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. I don't know about you, but if I was Mordecai, I'd be like, you did what? 
You didn't tell him yet? Why? Because she had a plan. She knew what God had called her to do, and she had planned ahead. Let me give you a, a, a big life lesson, okay? Don't get in a hurry to make decisions that are important. Now, I don't want you to go the other way and have paralysis of analysis. Okay, that's a problem too. When you just think about things and don't actually do them. We all know somebody like that at work. They talk a big game, but they never actually do anything. And you're like, wow, you were talking about that last year. Maybe you should do something, right? But many times, especially when people are angry or fearful, they make rash decisions and get in a hurry. One of the things you notice with Esther is what does she do? She has a good no. She has good boundaries. She doesn't spill all the beans. You don't have to, listen, you don't have to tell everybody everything. Did you know I don't feel like telling you that is an answer? Did you know no is a complete sentence? And some of us who as children were brought up, I'll tell you how high on your way up, need to learn good boundaries for our lives, not because we're angry or mad at people, but it's to do what God wants us to do. When you're on a plane and it decompresses, they say, first put your mask on and then put it on your child. Why? Because that kid is not going to take care of you. And the truth for many of us is some of you need to make sure Look in the mirror. Make sure you're spending time with God. Make sure you're spending time in prayer. Make sure you're taking care of yourself, but also willing sometimes to look at somebody and go, no, I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel like saying that. Listen to what it says. James 5, 7. I love this. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. And then I love this. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring's rains. So what's it talking about? The, the, the farmer has planted the seeds and then is waiting for God to move. Now, two mistakes we can make. Number one, not planting seeds. If you call yourself a Christian and you're not serving anywhere, you're not blessing anyone, you're not going out of your way to be a blessing, you're not using the gifts God's given you, then guess what? You're not even farming. But if you're a Christian and you get your feelings hurt and life doesn't go well and you're going through a difficult time, hey, you plant before it rains. You plant when God calls you to plant before the good times, sometimes in the bad times, some of the best planting that takes place is sometimes in the hardest time of your life. You are not responsible for the fruit, but you are responsible for what you plant. So are you planting and doing what God has called you to do? By the way, we need help in the children's ministry. Okay. <laughs> Number three, see, there, there, there it is. Number three, conscious of evil but doing good. And since, since school is starting soon, I'm going to give you my number one lesson I learned while student teaching. First week of school, I had a kid who was a jerk the first day, a jerk the second, right? You getting the idea? Jerk the third day, disruptive the fourth day, right? And so fifth day, I'm aggravated to the student and I went to the professor, Dr. Thornton, and I said, hey, this kid is driving me crazy. And here's what she said. I want you tomorrow before school to go sit in that kid's desk and pray for them. And here's what's amazing. That kid totally changed and became perfect. That is an absolute lie. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened. I changed towards that student. And I realized that I had become hyper-focused on that kid for good reason. But that I needed to recognize that I had to give that kid some grace in order to give them room to grow. And that kid actually improved over the semester, which that part shocking, honestly. The truth for many of us is we get so focused on the evil in the world that we can't do anything good because we're so mad about what's evil. Listen to what happens next. It's kind of interesting. They go from talking about Esther to all of a sudden this part. And I'm going to tell you why I think this is in here. Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him. By the way, Haman's all about Haman. Do you notice that? And how he had been elevated above the other nobles and officials. You ever know somebody who brags about themselves all the time? And that's not all, Haman added. 
I'm the only person that Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she's invited me along with the king tomorrow. Now, he's got a lot of great news. But this is why the Bible points this out, because for somebody who's evil or somebody who's self-centered, it is, listen, never enough. And we destroy, those folks destroy other people, anybody who they feel like is in competition with them. Listen to this. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I can see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching up to 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Don't think about that too much. It's not a good way to go. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. (laughs) Do Do you hear what his wife said to him? What a wonderful wife. Oh, that guy's bothering you? Wipe him out in the most painful way possible, and then go have a party. This suggestion then delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. That was a perfect husband and wife combination. What happened? In this story, all of a sudden, we have this side note about all the evil that's happening, and we don't see at all a response from Esther. We don't know if she was aware of it. I'm guessing she was. We don't know what she did about it. It doesn't talk about that. Why not? Because the focus is never on the evil. And yet, for Haman, the one thing he cared about was doing what is evil. He didn't care about all the good happening to him. He didn't care about all the blessings happening to him. All he really cared about was wiping somebody else who was in his way out. Be very careful that you don't get so focused on someone or something you don't like that you miss the blessings in your life. I know we're in election season. Some people are so angry about a politician who could care less about them and has no idea what your name is that they're ruining their family, that they're separating from lovable, caring people because they're so concerned about who they vote for and don't vote for. And here's the deal. I want you instead to do what is good. It, listen, it's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to have a political opinion. It's okay to have a reason why. It's okay to debate and discuss and have all the... I want you to do all of that. But if you find that you grit your teeth when you're talking about so-and-so, then you have a problem. And we have to learn how to walk in forgiveness and love as Christians. The Bible says they'll know us by our love. I would love if they said they'll know us by our opinions. But that's not what Jesus said. And so the truth is, when it comes to situations, listen to what it says in Romans 12 too. Remember this, especially this season. Do not be overcome by evil. And there's evil in the world. By the way, I could get up every week and build this congregation by making you all mad every week. Did you know some pastors do that on purpose? By the way, in some big churches, they plan it ahead what the crisis is going to be about. Did you know that? That's how, that's how sad it's gotten in churches. Why? Because I can motivate you by making you angry or afraid. But I don't want to motivate you that way. Because in eternity, what's it about? Do I love the people around me? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With more evil? With more mean words? With opinions? No, no, with love. So who are you loving? Who are you reaching out to? I dare you to find a friend that doesn't agree with you and bless them this week. I dare you to go out of your way. That coworker who talks way too much, bring him a goodie bag. That way you don't have to stay. You can just, right? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My friend Seth just got back from Uganda, and he's a pastor down south. We supported his church for many years, and they just got back. And a few years ago, Seth called me, and someone was attacking him about this trip. And I said to him, I said, you know what you need to do? Because I love to do that. Because I'm so smart. And I said, do what God tells you to do, regardless of what other people say or do. And so he kept the trip going, even though he wasn't sure about support and everything. And I want you to hear, he just got back from Uganda. By the way, Uganda has some political issues. I don't know if you knew that. But here's what he wrote. 
God supplied the funds to go. He supplied the team, listen to this, made up over a hundred Ugandans and Americans. God delivered many great blessings. Listen, 344 people made a decision to follow Jesus as local pastors preached and prayed over children and adults. 3,000 patients were registered, making up 7,000 patient visits among our various medical units, and thousands of prescriptions were filled, and over 800 hundred children participated in our kids resource program. Seth could have gotten focused on somebody who was attacking him. Seth could have got focused on the Ugandan government or whatever was going on down there. He could have gotten, but guess what he did? He said, this is what God, this is the good God has called me to do. And so he just continued to do the good. I wish you could meet Seth. He's an amazing person, but so are you. So do what God's called you to do. Don't get distracted by the evil people who attack you. Spend time in God's word. Spend time in prayer. Ask God to refocus your mind and your heart. Use what God's given. Be patient when you're dealing with trouble. Don't get in a hurry to buy that car. (laughs) Don't get in a hurry to, to deal with that situation. But ask God, God, would you help me to be obedient to you? And if you'll do that, God will use you in great ways. And you, you will overcome evil good. You'll break generational curses in your family. You'll see God do amazing things. Thanks for that amen in the back. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you would bless each one. Help us to know your presence. Lord, I know some people here are dealing with some evil people in their life, some hateful people. And so, Lord, for them especially today, I pray that you would help them to know that you said you would never leave us or forsake us. So, Lord, give them your strength today. Lord, I thank you that we have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome evil with good. Help us to do that. Lord, help us to not get distracted by what the world tells us is important. Instead, to seek what you say is important and to do your will every day. Lord, bless that one today who's struggling with fear, who's struggling with anger, who's struggling with discouragement. I pray right now they would know that you're going to walk with them and that they are in the king's presence. Give them your strength today. In Jesus' name, amen.